University of Cambridge. And today my talk is, don't interrupt me while I type, inferring text entered through gesture typing on Android keyboard. So essentially this talk is about the study of a new side channel that we have explored on the Android operating system. Uh, more specifically in this talk, we exploit the so-called procfs virtual file system, which is mounted by the Linux kernel at boot time under slash proc. Uh, and this procfs file system is called virtual simply because the files that it contains do not correspond to data stored on disk. Instead, the information you find on those in, this, in those files are uh, various pieces of information which are typically used for uh, troubleshooting purposes. So under procfs, we find uh, application-specific virtual files that uh, contain information about applications and processes. So for example, there's a, a file called TCP send, which basically contains the number of bytes that every particular app has sent over the network. So not surprisingly, those uh, application-specific virtual files have been shown repeatedly to enable substantial side channels. And so in the latest Android version, uh, those files have been locked down and they are no longer readable by third-party apps. However, under procfs, we also find uh, global virtual files that uh, contain information about the global state of the system. And uh, those global virtual files are still accessible even in the latest Android version. So not surprisingly, these are the files that we exploit in this work. Uh, to be more specific, there are two pieces of information that we leverage. Uh, the first is the, the number of hardware interrupts that the Android kernel uh, receives. And the second is the total number of context switches that the OS undergoes during uh, user input. So to make sure we're all on the same page, I'll assume for the rest of this talk that the uh, user has installed an app which is curious on his phone. And this curious app is trying nevertheless to, trying, uh, is trying nevertheless to infer what users type uh, on, in other apps on the phone. And this uh, curious app doesn't require any permission whatsoever. Uh, I'll further, f further assume that the user makes use of the so-called gesture typing feature that most uh, modern smartphone keyboards have. So with gesture typing, you can essentially uh, enter words uh, in a keyboard by dragging your finger from letters to letters. So there's an example here with the, uh, the word hello. So uh, what would happen is the user would put his finger on the, le on, the w on the letter H, drag it to E, then L, then O, at which point he would take his finger off the phone, off the, off the screen. So something I want to point out here is that uh, if you look at letters in the word hello, so for example, the letter E, uh, what you can see is that every time the, u the finger hits a letter, it's changing directions. And this effectively requires the finger to slow down right before it reaches E, uh, at which point it's, it has a speed which is virtually null, and then the, the finger will accelerate again in the other direction. So I'll just get back to this later on in the, in the presentation. So there are uh, two things that make the, uh, the attack possible. The first is that uh, every time you move your finger on the screen, the, uh, the screen reports uh, the finger position update to the uh, Android kernel. And this is done through the generation of hardware interrupts. And so you can see that the number of hardware interrupts that are received uh, does in fact leak some amount of information about what users have typed. Uh, second, the uh, application, so the genuine keyboard app where you enter uh, your text uh, also needs to uh, retrieve the position update of the finger from the kernel. The, the keyboard app runs as a, a standard uh, a process on the device and therefore to query the kernel it has to do some context switches. And essentially again, the number of context switches does reveal some amount of information about uh, what users have typed. And so in this work we leverage both, both the hardware interrupts and the software interrupts uh, to our advantage. So this graph shows you the, um, the speed at which the total number of context switches varies when a user types the word hello as a function of time. Uh, so what you can, so the, the blue line is the actual data recorded and the, uh, the green line, the dashed line, is the average data. So what you see is that when the, the finger starts at the letter H, the speed of the total number of context switches uh, increases then it remains constant for a little while, and then it decreases. Okay, and the, uh, the, the pattern repeats itself for, for other, other letters. So in fact, the, the speed of the total number of context switches loosely reflects what the, the finger does on the screen. As I pointed out earlier, the finger accelerates, remain constant, its speed remains constant for a little while, and then the, the finger slows down. 
And the, reasons the reason why it slows down is simple, is, is because as I pointed, I pointed out earlier, the finger is gonna, move, is gonna change directions, and therefore there's a, a decrease in speed here. So we're going to use the speed of the total number of context switches as, as one of the features to train the classifier uh, later on. So here at the top you see the, the, the total number of hardware interrupts that the Android kernel receives when a user types the word hello again. Uh, in between letters, you see that the number of hardware interrupts received grows linearly as a function of time. And then for each letter, you see those little plateaus. And those plateaus, in fact, correspond to um, the time when the finger has a speed which is virtually null, which uh, I pointed out earlier. So when the, the finger has a null speed, essentially just means that it's not moving, and therefore the screen need not report any updates to the, to the OS kernel. And therefore the total number uh, of hardware interrupts received remains constant, okay? So I'll refer to those plateaus as simply the zero speed events in the rest of this talk because they correspond to the finger having virtually a null speed. So what we do in this work is we, we use the, the position of those zero speed events as one of the features to train our classifier. So what, what we would like to be able to do is uh, be able to precisely locate where those zero speed events occur. And that's what's depicted in the, in the second image. Uh, unfortunately, in practice, everything doesn't work out as well as we, we would hope for. And what we only manage to get is what's depicted in the bottom picture. It's this kind of distribution of zero speed events, okay? And there are two reasons why we can't precisely locate those zero speed events. The first is that users move their finger really fast on the screen, and that makes the signal really noisy. Uh, and the second is that for certain words, there simply aren't any uh, zero speed events uh, at all. For example, if you consider the word ask, A-S-K, the finger might just go straight from A to K without stopping at S, okay? But more generally, uh, users tend to move their finger on the screen not using those uh, ideal straight lines that I, I showed you earlier. Uh, the trajectory of the finger looks more like this curved shape for this uh, light blue color word here. And this makes the, the, the signal even noisier for us uh, to be able to, um, to infer words. But nevertheless, the presence or the absence of those zero speed events, as well as their distribution, do in fact, do in fact correlate to what users type on the screen. So uh, another piece of the puzzle is, as I said earlier, we have this curious app on the phone which is reading those uh, virtual files and extract the, the interrupt data. So the interrupt data appears to the, uh, to the app as a continuous stream of data. And to be able to extract features for each word, it first has to tell to be able to figure out where the words are in this continuous stream of data. So uh, to do this, we reuse the uh, hardware interrupt, count interrupt counter. Uh, so this picture here shows you the, uh, the interrupt counter for the sentence, I trust you. Here on the right, you notice the zero speed events I talked about earlier for the, the letter O of the word U. But something that's more uh, striking in this picture is uh, the zero speed events in between words. And those in fact correspond to uh, the time when the finger is lifted off the screen by the, the user in between words, okay? Because those zero speed events last much longer, we can use them uh, to identify exactly where the words start and end in the stream of continuous data that we get. And this works re reliably in practice virtually 100% of the time. So to summarize, uh, in terms of features, we use the length of the words, uh, the position of the zero speed events, the one uh, for the letters, and the speed of the software hardware, uh, sorry, the software interrupt counter, also known as the context switch. And then we fit this to a classifier. So in terms of classifier, um, so we've looked at traditional classifiers such as an SVM, which take as input a, a single vector of features corresponding to a word, and then predicts another word. Uh, this, uh, so we looked at the SVM, it, it worked well for some users and, and quite poorly for, for other users. So we tried uh, to look for other possible classifiers. And the thing that we wanted to be able to model is the fact that a word can't actually be predicted in isolation. A word belongs to a sentence, it belongs to a context, and so we wanted to be able to model the fact that a word depends on all the previous words that come before it in a sentence. So uh, an HMM is one step in this direction, but it can only model the dependency between a word and its predecessor. So uh, in fact, it turns out that we can do better than an HMM, and we can, we can use so-called recurrent neural networks, 
These are neural networks which have been ex extensively studied by the NLP community. And those can, in fact, model the dependency of a word and uh, all its predecessors. In practice, what that means is that instead of, like for an SVN, instead of giving as input a single vector, we're going to feed the RNN with a list of vectors where each vector corresponds to a word in a sentence. Okay? So I won't get into the detail here, but if you're interested, it's, it's in the paper. So in terms of evaluation, we looked at the, the Google keyboard. Uh, we had a real chat corpus of 10,000 English sentences, which was collected by another group of researchers back in 2006. Within this corpus, we limited ourselves to the most common 200 words. Uh, the reason for this will become clear in a minute. Uh, for training, we had each of our participants enter a um, series of words in an application that we developed. Each word occurred roughly 20 times. And so in total, each participant entered roughly 4,000 words. It took each of our participants between a week and a month to complete the task. And so it was so time consuming for them that uh, this explains why we limited ourselves to the most common 200 words uh, during the study. Um, so something that I didn't mention uh, explicitly, but which is true for uh, usually all kinds of classifiers, is that when during the prediction phase, the RNN, the recurrent neural network, doesn't just give us you know, the word that it predicts. Instead, it, it gives us a list of the most likely words that the, the user has entered. Okay, so the, the, uh, the word that appears in the first position is the most likely, the one in second position is the second most likely, and so on. So on this graph, what you, show, what you see is the uh, prediction accuracy for, uh, for, single word, for a single word prediction. The first bar here essentially tells us that roughly 34% 34, 34 of the time, the correct word entered by uh, the user appears in first position in the list that the RNN has output. And then 10% of the time, the uh, correct word appears roughly in, uh, appears in second position in the list, and so on and so forth. As part of uh, our evaluation, we also looked at um, trying to re-identify users that post uh, messages anonymously on messaging boards. So there's this app called Yikyak, which apparently is, is used quite a lot in the US, and uh, it allows users to post messages anonymously on a messaging board, on a messaging board. and by anonymous, uh, it just means that there is no username or pseudonym associ associated with the, uh, the post. And then other Yikyak users can read those messages, so long as they are physically in the vicinity of the sender. Okay, but they can't tell who posted which message because of the lack of username and, and things like that. So what we try to do here is trying to um, re-identify which sentence was typed by which user. And uh, I repeat myself, but we are, we are still assuming that the, every user has this curious app installed on the device, okay? So I can't go into the details on how we get from the RNN prediction all the way down to how we re-identify users, but I want to give you a, an overview of, of how well we can re-identify users in practice uh, with the techniques that we described uh, earlier. So uh, this line here, the blue line at the bottom, uh, corresponds to uh, a set of 35 sentences. And the point right here in the middle corresponds to uh, sentences of length three, okay? And so for this scenario, we can roughly, uh, you, we can re-identify users 80% 80, 80 of the time. I said otherwise, we can re-identify 80% of the users. As the number of sentences uh, decreases, so as the number of sentences post on the messaging board decreases, the uh, predictions uh, improve. And so for a set of 10, 10 uh, sentences, we can re-identify uh, roughly 93% of, of users. And then as you move towards the, the, the right side of the graph, the, uh, the size of the sentences grow bigger and the predictions uh, also improve. And this is kind of intuitive because the more words you have in a sentence, essentially the more data you have, the more information you get, and, the, and therefore the easier it gets to uh, re-identify users. So to wrap up, uh, so what we did in this work is we tried to show that hardware and software interrupts do correlate to what users type on the device. And more importantly, uh, that global virtual files do enable new side channels. Uh, we think we could improve the results if we had more data uh, to train the RNN with. And in terms of future directions, it might be possible to reuse the hardware software uh, side channel uh, to attack more traditional keyboards. And more generally, it might be also possible to try to infer what people, people do uh, on their phone um, using this new side channel. And that's all.
Thank you.